Drew, with MTSB itself, how can players make sure they're bringing these to life? Look, I, I think it's about being really purposeful with what they do. So certainly the coaching staff will be there to try and um, guide these things happening. But ultimately the program is the player's program. So, um, you know, we often do things like um, pre-game or halftime talks and challenge players to get up and, and, and do those. And some players are more or less comfortable, for instance, with getting up and doing that. But look at that as, you know, is that a you versus yourself moment? So if standing up and talking in front of peers isn't something that you're super comfortable with, is that something that you can start to develop? Um, will that necessarily turn you into a professional footballer? No. Um, will it make you more comfortable speaking in front of people, which might have some benefits throughout the rest of your life in or outside of football? Probably. Um, you know, what things will set you apart? Is it that you're just going to be a great communicator on the pitch? So we've had some really good masterclasses previously um, and so just some key takeaways from, from what they've learnt and been able to see from all of those were um, you, you versus yourself, uh, what sets you apart as a, as a player, some important viewpoints that positions aren't necessarily fixed, especially at the ages that we're, we're working with here, um, some resilience and adaptability and Certainly, uh, driven home it is about developing your, your super strength um, as, as a player. So, Drew, what, why do each of these matter to players? Look, I think um, I think they matter because they're things that shone through just about every masterclass. And one of the things about those masterclasses we had is uh, we had players from all around the world, um, different ages, played in different competitions. And for me... Um, Sort of the, these five things, they, they shone through from all of them. And the other bit about why they're important is um, they're all controllable. Um, you know, that you versus yourself thing, I think it's pertinent that it's number one because it's probably the bit that, that underpins it all. And um, I think there's a lot of players, especially now that the age these guys are getting to, that, that look at others who are, having, you know, maybe being played up an age group, making it into an A-League academy, a Joey's camp, and think, ah, oh, you know, I want to be there. And, um, you know, I, I guess the big bit is, you know, find what will set you apart. Think about how you, you're adaptable. Don't let somebody getting into something affect how you are. Have that resilience. And, and you know, the important bit, like, you know, all those people we spoke to, none of them spoke about being the complete footballer who can do everything. They all spoke yeah. about the thing that made them stand out and then when they got their chance, they were ready and made the most of it. Yeah, great. Um, so Warren Drew just touched on how this uh, affects the players. How, how do you see these key takeaways affect the TSP program overall? Yeah, it's, um, I guess, one of our key things that we've tried to get across with the program in itself is that uh, the overall program has evolved. Um, it's evolved significantly over the last two years and that has allowed us to, to grow uh, with that and it's allowed us to start to look at really what do we want uh, to provide in terms of environment for our players here in New South Wales and then how that lends itself to giving those individuals within our programs and within our environments the best opportunity to succeed. Uh, again, Drew just touched on each of the five points, but when we actually sat down as a collective and actually went through the previous masterclasses, uh, there was a whole raft. So these are just some of the key ones, but I think what the TSP program has actually allowed us to do is, is to grow and give opportunities to the individuals to actually grow and develop themselves and, and understanding that every journey is different for an individual player and, and what journey they take and then how they actually apply that in their environments is different as well. But knowing if you take each of these uh, and knowing where you are as an individual and where you're currently at as part of your, your overall plan for yourself and what you want to achieve within that plan, we hope that the TSP program will assist in that process. Right. So just uh, tell me a little further in that, Warren, how do these influence how the players train by themselves and then now they've gone back into uh, their club environments. How, how do they use these in their club environments as well? 
Yeah, again, we've had some fantastic guests that have been a part of each of these masterclasses and, and Drew touched on it earlier on that in each of those, there was commonalities that came out of every single masterclass that each of these players have over experienced as part of their journey. And although their journeys have been different to a certain extent and, and what level they've played at, where they've played at, what positions they've played in, we took these as sort of the, the key take-homes and if there was one thing that really stood out is that the, the sort of formal training environment, if you will, is very, very important to an individual player, but also your intrinsic motivation to want to be the best version of yourself, to take yourself um, out of the comfort zone, to be able to then learn from what you're doing in your own environment, in, in the formal environment, and then decompartmentalize that. And actually, what does it mean to you as an individual and how do you actually train that on your own? not on your own, maybe it's just on that you against the wall, which is some of the things that we've, we've talked about, certainly during the, the lockdown, but moving forward, how are you as an individual going to best prepare yourself? And if you look at each of these headings, uh, I think what's come out is, is that all of the, the players uh, from the masterclasses that we've had, they learn to play, they learn to tackle themselves uh, psychologically. Uh, they wanted to be the best version of themselves. And if they looked to other players and their peers, it was what they were doing and how did they actually develop themselves? And then were they using those and taking those uh, tips or ideas and just adding those to their, to their own toolbox? Uh, playing in multiple positions and, and having resilience, you're going to have challenges. You're going to, it's going to be testing times for you. There's going to be times where it's not going to go according to plan and you have to put yourself in a position whereby you have a plan if it isn't going according to plan, that there is a potentially an A, B and C. Uh, but because you've given yourself that opportunity to be the best version of yourself, you've got, you've better prepared yourself to be able to do that. Uh, and, and again, what's your super strength and, and how do you actually develop that? And you may not just have one, you may have, have a few. And how do you actually look to take that into your individual training environment and keep on building as an individual player to bring it back into the team context? Yeah, great. Uh, was there anything you wanted to add to that, Drew? Uh, you know, not necessarily, but I, I think one thing that's important, we'll probably touch on it a bit later as well, is that you know, for the players, it, it's their journey, but there's all these different environments and sometimes they can be seen as different things. So I train on myself. I've, I've got my MPL club. I've got my TSP training. I've got my school football, maybe. You know, I've got my futsal, maybe. But, you know, I'd encourage everyone to start looking at it and going, well, those are those are all important parts. They're interconnected. And the thing that interconnects them all is you. And so regardless of what that environment is, there's going to be something that comes from it. So you look at Nathan Burns and, you know, he was in that team where he had to dribble past everybody. And it's like, well, there's something that he took from an environment that's not an MPO environment. That's not a Joey's camp, a state team. You know, that's a that's from something that he developed when he was when he was young, you know. Um, so, yeah, really looking at it and going, well, <clears throat> these are all environments for me. Um, these are the trainings I do in a week. I don't want to overload myself. So when I'm at school training, is the level at the same as TSP? Probably not. Possibly, depending on what school you go to, but possibly not. But you can be at the same level as you and you can keep pushing yourself same with everything. Um, same when you're, you're having a kick around in the garden, you know, how well can I do this? Can it help me improve? Um, are there some really tangible things I'm trying to get better at and how do they link to me becoming the best version of myself? Excellent. So if we just look at uh, how TSB sits and, and how we, how we uh, identify players what, what TSP involves and how we support it. Um, how does the learning and the TSP link into the wider football journey for the players? And, and noting that the, the actual program delivery may be a little different to, to Metro and Indian country. Uh, for Drew, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Look, look, I think the important bit is that, um, you know, one of the things we probably had when we, when we started out trying to evolve the TSP is that this was kind of a cycle that went in one direction. Um, and a bit like I talked about there, it, it doesn't go in one direction. It, it's very much links back um, to itself. So players can come in and out of TSP, for example, TSP staff are out watching games. Um, players can come in and out of elite games, but also the, I think, I think the big bit for, for, for me out of all of this is that if you're, if you're say in the TSP, um, or any environment and you're saying, oh, this looks different to my club. 
this looks better than for reasons A, B, C. Can you actually be somebody that then goes back and, you know, pulls everybody else up along with you? So, for instance, an IDP that you've done at TSP, are you going back to your club coach and saying to them, look, this is, this is what I'm working towards. This is my journey to become the best version of me. Can you help me with this? Are you going back to a school coach? If you do some individual training, you're going to that person. This is what I need. This is what I think I need. This is how you can help me. You know, and, and not look at all these different parts um, of the journey as themselves. Like I said, interconnect them. Make sure it's partly about you. Now, within that, every environment you go into, you also need to fit into the team. It, it is a team sport. Um, so then it's about finding that balance between how do you help improve yourself, but how do you help improve everybody around you, uh, pull them all up with you and stay stay on your, on your own journey. Yeah, good. Uh, Warren, what, what are some tips for players to ensure they bring their IDPs to life inside and, and then outside of that TSP environment? Again, just linking it to, to Drew's comments there is that every individual will have dreams of playing at the top level. I think if we look currently at our TSP program and the players that are in the program, the players that are wanting to get into the program, the players that have gone, into, gone through the program and gone on to the next level, they all had dreams of moving on to that next level, but the ones that really set themselves apart from the rest of the ones that actually give themselves goals. And your IDP effectively is setting goals that are realistic and measurable and giving yourself the best opportunity to know exactly where you sit. So there's no point with your IDP saying that you, you want to play for the Socceroos right now or you want to play in the English Premier League or you want to play somewhere around uh, somewhere else around the world. It's how you're actually going to get there. So you, you've already got the why you want to be a professional player, but the what and the how you're actually going to do that as an individual is going to set you aside from the, from the rest as well. And again, if we link that back into the masterclasses previously, that is what they had to learn to do and they did it in a different way. But unconsciously, maybe, they had they didn't have a, a structured IDP for them. They didn't have a template that they actually filled out. They sort of learned along the way. And that's all we've done is we've just developed that. And where the IDP is quite, it's quite basic and, and it sticks to those four corners. What it does allow you to do, it allows you to actually give yourself some realistic and measurable goals that you can attain. And again, talking to, to Drew's points with regards to you've got school, you've got your NPL environment, you've got the TSP environment. Some of you may be afforded an opportunity to go into a national team's camp, but what does one take to get there? And then what are you going to do to give yourself the best chance to get into that? And, and again, it was very much a, a one-way cycle, but those arrows go back and forth. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to actually be in New South Wales where the majority of the national team's unit actually resides. So there's more opportunities for them to actually see our players from the TSP program, from the NPL, uh, and furthermore, on a more regular basis. So again, have you given yourself that best opportunity? And you don't know when they're looking. It might not just be in the TSP program. It might be that they travelled into a regional area to watch a gala day or to watch a tournament. It might be that they're actually watching NPL games uh, close to where they actually reside themselves. But you have to be, as an individual, thinking and having the mindset that someone's always looking. So how do I prepare myself best? How do I give myself the best opportunity where I'm always going to be at 110%? It can't just be 100%. If you want to really set yourself aside from the rest and then using that IDP and, and using that as a, as a measure of accountability, uh, not just on yourself, but, but leaning on uh, the coaches that you're working with in your own environments as well uh, and get them to, to have an honest conversation with you. It doesn't have to be uh, about negative, negative, negative all the time, but what are the positives? How do you build on the positives? If there are areas of improvement, you'll probably know what those areas of improvement are if you're realistic. Uh, and, but honestly, giving yourself uh, some set goals, potentially each term, and building on those and then reflecting and making sure that you reflect as often as possible as an individual uh, and being honest with yourself through that reflection process. And that's incredibly difficult to do. And, and at the age that you're at, still a long way to go, but a huge opportunity. Right. I think uh, one, of the, one of the surprising perhaps or common themes from the players was that their path wasn't always smooth sailing. A few of the players, mistake teams, had some, some drawbacks. So, so Drew, could you how would how would the players incorporate that into their their journey, 
and and specifically more their IDPs where they might have had a goal to make a state team, for example, but they, they haven't uh, haven't made that team. Um, how do they readjust their, their goals and who should they talk to at, at that point? Yeah, look, I think... Um... I think you're you're dead right there. So so for for nearly all of them, you know, Mark Milligan was saying he he didn't really get seen by anybody until um, seventeen. Um, you know, Lloyd much the same, Spence much the same. Um, you know, whereas different ones were were in different things at different 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 ages um, and stages. And I get I guess ultimately it comes back to that thing that yeah. So all these different selection points along the way say into a tsp or maybe a state team at joey's camps yes they're they're steps along the way but they're not the only step um you know you can take a little bridge up and over it or you can walk beside it or whatever it's going to be but the, the biggest bit is to have that mindset that you're not going to give up and you're going to keep going right well that one wasn't so what's the next one i'd suggest the first the first thing to do always um, I'll say it quite often, but look in the mirror before you look out the window. So that's, you know, before you kind of go crying to somebody about not making it or saying, why didn't I? The first thing is to, you know, say to yourself, well, why did I not? And look, the answer might be right now, I'm very, very, very close, but there's somebody absolutely outstanding in front of me at the moment. If you look at a state team, there's 17 players, there's potentially three two for whatever position you play. So is the answer maybe, well, I'm not quite adaptable enough at the moment. You might look at it and go, ah, as a number nine, I was behind Andrew Fernley. That's true. But, geez, do you know what? As a winger, I think I probably would have got in ahead of Warren, but maybe they don't know that I can play as a winger as well or I can play as a 10 or a six or an eight or whatever it might be. You know, so go back to it and think to yourself, well, first of all, why not? And then from there... um, you know, if you've built good trusting relationships with your coaches, with the TSP staff, with people like yourself and Warren and I, you know, I think ultimately um, nearly every coach is there to try and help you succeed. Um, you know, that, that ultimately should be the aim of every youth coach to get every single player that comes, you know, through their teams to be the best possible version of themselves. That's not to say we're going to get everyone to be a professional. You know, it's, what is it, point oh five percent of players in the English academy system become professional footballers you know a hundred players can play for the Socceroos um, you know over a huge period so that can't necessarily be the end goal but the, the end goal is well did I do everything I possibly could right now if the answer is yes brilliant it's just that somebody didn't see you right now keep going if the answer is not quite I could have done a b and c get after that and ultimately, it's about staying there for the whole time. And, you know, Shannon um, Cole had that great point. You're kind of auditioning for something, but you don't know when that's going to come up. So ultimately, you've just got to be ready because, you know, there's nothing worse than the moment comes up. You know, you get an opportunity of one of these things and, and you weren't ready. And you look back and think, geez, I wasn't ready for that. And, you know, we've spoken to people along the way that that have that same that same kind of example, much better to be thinking to yourself, no, I'm going to be ready, I'm going to be ready and staying on it. Excellent. Uh, was it, Drew's covered a fair bit there, but was there anything anything different you wanted to add? No, I think you hit the nail on the head there. And like I say, everyone's journey is different for understanding where you're at and uh, placing yourself in an environment that you're going to enjoy as well because we don't want this to be uh, an experience that's a that's a poor one where you, you put everything into it, and you, your heart and soul, your dedication, you're driven to do it, but you're in an, env- in an environment that potentially isn't right for you. So, so don't be afraid sometimes to actually have a look at what's the best environment for, for you right now. And like you say, you, there's many, many different environments that you're going to be in and hopefully you have good uh, opportunities to be with coaches that have the experience that want to support you as well as part of that journey. And sometimes that won't happen. And then it's how do you, again, have that mindset, have that resilience to give yourself the best opportunity to succeed. Excellent. So just here, we're going to have a a look at a video of, of a TSP elite game. So again, it's something relative to players that have been in the program. Um, just have a look at in this small video what, what attributes are relevant to all players across 
positions that they're playing and, and have a look at what skills are required across different positions. So good to finish in the goal there. Uh, Drew, what, what skills are required by all players, um, regardless of the position, from ever highlighted in that video? Yeah, look, I'd say, I'd say look, across all of them, the key ones are um, just the variety of ways to receive and then retain and then release the ball. Um, so... You know, players receiving with no pressure and looking to take touches forward, players receiving under pressure um, and dribbling away from the pressure, but then releasing at the right time. Um, a few players within that, you see them play some with their left and some with their right foot. Um, different varieties of passing distances. So a lot of them are short. Some of them are played in along the floor into the nine's feet as he comes back. And then there's the ball over the top when that space becomes available. And then the other one really is that when you watch that blue team, pretty much every player is consistently on the move, making an option, um, trying to challenge that final line. Um, and then, you know, at the, at the end, you know, it's a, it's a great finish, but it, it comes from a lot of patience and players ultimately being able to just stay on the ball for the right amount of time consistently across the field. Yeah, excellent. Um, Warren, how, how can players be more purposeful in how they train to maximise their chances of success to, to achieve some of the, the skills that we've seen in, in the video just there? Yeah, I, I think visuals are always great and, and having a look at this very short video, but there's so much that's come out of it in, in what was 40 seconds. Uh, one team's attacking, one team's defending. I guess a question to the players right now is when you actually watch this video, how many of you actually just watched the ball and where the ball was or how many of you actually zoomed out and actually potentially related it to your position that you play in or multiple positions that you actually play in? And then whether it was the attacking team or the defending team, where did you take your lens and actually look at that? So if you were when we're looking at the blue team and building up, how did they actually build up? How did they move the ball through the thirds? Once the ball was moved on, if you relate it to your position as an individual and you're starting to think, and I think I've talked to this before in terms of where's the ball going, where's the opposition, where's the target, where's the space? Can we be proactive? Uh, can we be creative regardless of what position in the field that we're in? Uh, uh, but also being mindful that what's our insurance policy as well. So how do we, once we're in a position, potentially we re receive the ball, we get on the ball, we are proactive, we're able to get a good touch facing forward. Once we've done that, how do we actually support a teammate? How do we get into a position that there's an insurance policy? If we've lost the ball, do we stay connected? Uh, if we lose the ball, are we able to get pressure on the ball quickly? Do we have to delay it and, and just drop off? And do we understand not just what we're doing technically as individuals on the ball all the time, but also from a positioning and communication point of view, how are we supporting not only ourselves to get successful outcomes, but supporting those that are around us in the close proximity? And then further down the line, what's our communication? You don't necessarily have to be loud to just be a good communicator. That might be visual cues as well. Uh, but one, one, understanding what your role is as an individual in this particular instance and then two how does that relate to the team and then what's the overall team objective as well and do you have clarity and understanding as to what that is and what the purpose is for that particular game and depending on the environment that you're actually in it might be very very different so when we talk to this particular game 
for all intents and purposes, even though it is a game, it's a training session. It's an opportunity for players to be brave, to be creative, to be adaptable, to play in multiple different positions. Uh, and how do you actually use that as the fuel for the fire to actually give yourself the best opportunity to get successful outcomes? And then again, linking it back to those IDPs that we've already talked about. It might be that you're only going to set yourself three goals. But based on what information you have and that clarity that you have from the coach, your understanding of what your roles and responsibilities are from an individual point of view, in this particular instance, the position that you're actually playing, and then how do you support those around you as well? So I would challenge um, when this video goes out again, uh, potentially don't just look at the ball, but potentially look at further, widen that lens, like I said, and have a look. If you're a uh, defender or you're an attacker, which one was you looking at? Can you look at both of those scenarios, the attacking team both and the defending team? And then what does it mean to you as an individual? And then collectively, what are the outcomes that we're looking to achieve? And then you link that back into it. Again, just giving yourself that best opportunity through a, a wider lens, if you will. Yeah, great. So just touching on that again, Drew, as well. So when players are, are really looking at, at video and and they're more than likely going to be watching video that includes themselves. How much should be uh, them, them looking at decisions that they've made or on the ball or off the ball? And then, you know, is there is some role for them to analyse the other players, what, what they've done? So, for example, when the centre-backs played a, a piecing ball through the middle to the nine, um, is that something that you'd encourage players to be to be looking at in their analysis of, of football as well? Yeah, definitely. Look, I think the first thing is, is to, when you're looking back on video of yourself, first of all, um, you know, have a look at have a look at what you did and what you possibly. So, if it went well, why did it go well? Was it the right decision? Did you execute it well? If it didn't go so well, um, and that's probably where a lot of us go back and look at it more, try and work out well, was it my decision there or or the execution of it that went wrong? So if, if you decide, well, that was the right decision, maybe that shows you that you're going to have some practice on that particular skill execution when you're training by yourself. If it was maybe the decision that got wrong, you try to think to yourself, ah, well, why was that? Did I actually see that other option or am I only seeing that now because I'm watching it on a video from another angle? Um, why didn't I say it? Maybe, maybe the problem with a pass wasn't that at all. It was that maybe you didn't open up and, and scan um, enough or, or to the right place prior to receiving, et cetera. And then, look, I think, I think the other piece that, that there's, a, there's a really good part is to analyse to also build connections with teammates. So it might be that you're looking at a video and thinking to yourself, okay, well, the reason I, uh, as the winger there, I'm able to get in behind is actually because of the movement of another player. So maybe you start to say to your mates, look, when you do that, I got to go in there. But if I'd done this, maybe you could go and you start to actually come up with little relationships between yourself. So it might be you as a winger with the fullback that's behind you and you, you become mates and you start to look at it and say, all right, so when I go inside, it's probably a cue for you to go around the outside. But if I'm on the outside, stay back. I need you under or I want you to underlap at this time. Nines and tens, can you start to develop a, an understanding of when you're going to come short, when you're going to run beyond, um, you know, and, and also starting to look at it and think, okay, well, when I'm watching the video, that's maybe what this particular teammate of mine seems to consistently do. So maybe there's an opportunity for me to link with them there. You know, oh, I never saw that my nine always runs. That's a great run he's made there. He's made it five times this game and I never played it. Um, so potentially then you're looking at it and thinking, all right, well, that's an interesting run at training, for instance. I'm going to try and get my head up even a line further because now I'm starting to think oh, I always go in at my six and eight there, don't I? Or I? You know, the furthest I look forward is is into my tens feet, but maybe every now and then I can actually play that ball um, over the top that gets them in, for an example. Or maybe I can play that ball out to my winger's feet rather than needing to go through my number 10 to make it there. Um, so looking at the game as a whole, um, looking at where what it is that you want to work on. Is it something you can work on by yourself? Is it something you need to work on in the team environment? Or is it something you don't know how to work on? In which case, um, hopefully, there are people around you that can help you with the answers. Yeah, good point. Andy, could I just add to that as well? Just yeah, for sure. Quickly, just, um, 
just a thought more than anything else because where the players are now at in their age and stage and as part of their journey, a lot of them will already start to use analysis and they'll, they'll be quite savvy with video technology. Uh, parents uh, recording games and then allowing the players to go back and watch those games themselves or the NPL club might be providing footage as well. And, and more often than not, we're looking for all the good things that we do all the time. And then we're starting to put highlights packages together of the good things to showcase ourselves and potentially use that uh, to then give yourself an opportunity to be selected at another level. Um, what I'm saying here is, is that you don't need to send the bad things on when you're looking to promote yourself. But are you, in terms of your own IDP, potentially collecting a catalogue of areas where you do need to improve? And then breaking that down as an individual, uh, as to Drew's point was, uh, you might have looked to, you've seen something, it hasn't come off, so you haven't executed it. But you, you've actually seen it, that's something. So if you was to break that down and it, in the most simplest form and then give yourself, why did it break down? Why didn't I execute it right? What would I need to do next time round to ensure that I do execute that technically, perfectly or better? And then judge yourself on that. And they're the small goals or the small measures you can actually make by having that reflection process through not just highlighting the good stuff that you do, but also the areas potentially that you do need to improve on. And then again, how does that relate to you as an individual? And then how does it lend itself to the team environment and how you support the team with the overall outcomes that you're looking to achieve as well? Some good advice. So, Drew... We have some high level properties that were required that we saw in the video, but without uh, delving into too much detail, uh, we've got some, some on the screen here. So for example, we've got for the nine, the movement to engage defenders, seven, 11 positioning and timing of runs. How trainable are these alone, Drew? Or how, which ones are they, or are some of these more specific to being in a team environment? Look, I, th I think it's probably a mix. Um... So something like, um, you know, maintaining possession and depth is, is going to be a lot easier within a team environment. That said, if you're at home with a wall and you play it against the wall and then get used to then repositioning back off to be able to take your touch pot potentially to one side or the other and you think to yourself, well, I'll play it against it, I'll drop off when I turn right, that's my centre-back part. Now, if I go left, that's a full-back then something like that can probably be replicated. Again, 1v1 pressure from all angles, tricky without somebody to put that pressure on, but the starting point of that will still become, well, where does your first touch go and is it under control? Because your second touch is probably the most important then. Um, so we, we talked about it um, in a couple of the different ones, but potentially you visualize, well, where's the pressure going to come from here? Um, I'm going to play it off a wall. I'm going to pretend pressure's coming from there. So therefore, my arm's going to go up. I'm going to get my hip in the way. My first touch is going to go there. What would I then do? I'm going to burst away. I'm going to dribble and I'm going to play um, either to my winger or my fullback. And those are the two kinds I'm going to set up. Um, you know, body and ball control and protecting and staying on the ball. Again, um, you know, these are things that in a small practice or in a, in a, in a, a team environment, will be easier but there is always time on your own and it just takes a bit of thinking about well what what do i actually need to do here where would the defender be coming from and then starting to really think about it movement you know that maybe engages defenders again team environment ideally but um quick movements being able to do one movement for the defender one for yourself that can probably be done with a wall as well in terms of just getting used to the movements of going away to come short or coming short to, to go away. Um, and then there are some that definitely look in terms of positioning and timing of a run that that's highly dependent on um, what your first, you know, what your, your teammates touch look like, where have they taken it? Where's the defenders? What run therefore makes sense. So there are some things that no doubt you, you, you need teammates um, or, or some kind of pressure. Um, but a lot of it can probably be built out themselves. And importantly, when you do go in with teammates, are there, are there some things linked to your IDP, linked to what you're trying to get better at that you're going to practice um, to do? Great. Um, so, Warren, we, with players getting more knowledge comes ability to have a greater understanding and 
add some greater detail, for example, when and how to protect the ball relative to, to space or defender? How, how do players work out what they need to do for themselves? Again, it's uh, there'll be some team objectives. There'll be some things that that you want want to achieve, and depending on the position that you're actually playing in, if you have an understanding of what your roles and responsibilities are within that team, then you can start to uh, give yourself some goals as to what you're going to look to do to to achieve those uh, as an individual. So, an, an example being that you talked to there was if if you're looking to to move the ball or protect the ball. Uh, and keep it away from the defender. So if I'm a number nine as an attacking player, uh, am I self-aware? Am I aware of what's around me, first and foremost? Am I aware of where, not only where the ball is on the pitch, but where the opposition is as well? And then where do I place myself to give myself the best opportunity to, one, if the ball does come into my feet, take a first touch that's positive, either to protect the ball away from the defender or potentially to take first touch facing forward beyond the defender. So if, I, if I'm a number nine, as an example, it might be that I'd be dropping in front of the defender just to play the ball into another player or teammate uh, to try and unlock the defence. Or we've recognised potentially the opposition are playing, as an example, with a high line. So how do I actually put myself in a position where I'm off the shoulder of the defender? It might be the stopper uh, or it might be a fullback, but I can get in behind, but recognising how, how and when to make that run. And then also your teammate recognising when to, to play the ball behind. So there was a great example last night of Tommy Rogic for, for Celtic uh, with an assist and the defender understanding, uh, sorry, the attacker understanding when to actually pull off the shoulder and play in behind uh, and the ball actually in and the technique to actually play that pass with the right pace, the right weight to take him in on his first touch. And then he still had a lot to do and the first touch was sublime and the finish was even better. But it all came from recognising when to be positive with a touch, move the ball quickly, what pace to move the ball with. And there's 101 things racing around in your mind at any one given time. And that's what's beautiful about the game. So how do you actually simplify that and give yourself the best opportunity by playing in the future? Can you start to see things before they actually happen? So your head's up before you've even taken your first touch. You're recognising where to make that run, when to make that run. Is the pass going to go in behind? Are you going to need to drop off because there's pressure on the ball carrier? But by looking at those different parts and then breaking that down and then working yourself through that, both as a, in the collective team environment, but also as an individual when you're practising as well, taking yourself through that process. There's a lot of detail there and, and it, the detail will be different for every single position. But if you understand what the detail is and the roles and responsibilities are of more positions, that might give you a better understanding of what to do when you're supporting a ball carrier or you're the ball carrier yourself. And then depending on where that is on the field, it might be different. So I've just given an example of the number nine, but that's only one example, but you could actually break that down and provide much more detail across all of the positions from goalkeeper to number nine. Uh, but understand what your role and responsibility is first and foremost and how do you actually bring that back into the team objectives. Great. So, uh, look, we all, we all know players are on their own journey. Uh, Warren, how do they? How do players best work out and develop what they need to fit together for the pieces of the puzzle? Yeah, and, and again, it's um, very, very complex in, in how a player develops themselves and the journey that they take themselves on. I think historically there's been a lot of emphasis placed on technical, tactical uh, side of the game and then even more so the physical side of the game. So I'm sure lots of players have come up through their own uh, journey to now where it potentially it was the picking the bigger, the faster, the, the stronger players in the short term. But these players that we now have uh, within the TSP programme they're starting to get into a space where they're, they're physically starting to actually develop as well and starting to catch other players up that might have been an early developer. So we've looked at this as a, as a collective within the, the Football New South Wales uh, technical department. Uh, and again, these are just some things. They're not all of the things, but what we've discussed internally to try to take the TSP program to another level to support players as a part of their own journey and understanding that every journey is different and, and every player is dis different as a part of that journey. Uh, and then what does winning mentality mean? And, and do if, if I was to ask a TSP player, what is winning mentality to you? Are they able to articulate that as well? And, and then how does that lend itself in the psychological, the social 
uh, spaces as well, because the reality is, and, and Drew said earlier on, that only 0.05% of players are making it in the English uh, Premier League, as an example, that small percentage of player. We still want to develop good people and good people to be in those football environments as, as well. So what is it that you do, not just on the field, but off the field as well? If you're going to represent your country, there's going to be certain standards that you're going to have to adhere to. Uh, and is it one, not only adhering to them, but actually understanding them and why those values and beliefs have actually been placed in there uh, as well? So when you look at the environments that you're in and you take this graphic as an example, on the, the left-hand side, you're one part of that puzzle. But that puzzle, if all the pieces are put together and you go to the right-hand side and, the, and these player traits, well, they're what we're talking to do now. So when we're talking uh, our football language within the Football New South Wales landscape and certainly within the, the talent support programme, it is the ABC. So have we got players that can be adaptable, can be brave and creative and give themselves the best opportunity through that to win every moment? and give themselves that best opportunity by taking themselves through this process and breaking this process down. So this is something we'll actually make available to the players and and also to the parents as well, because uh, I think it's a a nice graphic in in its infancy and it will evolve. And uh, and that's through consultation with the national teams unit uh, from from a Joey's perspective. Under 23s are currently away in Dubai right now and we're talking with them on a daily. I've I've just come off of another workshop Uh, with Trevor Morgan, the national team, uh, sorry, national technical director that's supporting the teams over there in the under 23s. And we're literally having the same discussions. It's about individuals and then how, when they come into that team environment, understanding what their role is as an individual and then how they bring that to the team context as well, uh, both on and off the ball. And these are just some little descriptors that we've come up with that that we think might support players, but uh, sort of flipping it on its head to a certain extent and leading with the psychological and the social and those different aspects that that fall into each of those. And then how, once you've got the psychological and and social traits um, of knowing what you you are as an individual, where you're currently at, and then how is that going to lend itself to give yourself the best opportunity from a technical and tactical perspective as well. And then you can develop that, that, that physical element, but your, your super strength might be you've got speed. So how do you actually use your speed using all of these different areas when and where? Uh, so that, that, that's a, just a, a small visual that we're, we're working to, and that might assist you as an individual with your IDPs, and it might assist the coaches that you're working with in other environments as well. Um, and, and they may have their own one as well. But certainly when you come into the talent support program, this is what we're, we're looking at now when we're looking at players as individuals and then how they fit into that, that team perspective. Uh, just revisiting the, the key takeaways that we, that we uh, found from across all the masterclasses are, Drew, within TSP itself, how can players make sure they bring at least to life? Look, I... I think it's about being really purposeful with what they do. So certainly the coaching staff will be there to try and um, guide these things happening. But ultimately the program is the players program. So, um, you know, we often do things like um, pre-game or halftime talks and challenge players to get up and, and, and do those. And some players are more or less comfortable, for instance, with getting up and doing that. But look at that as, you know, is that a you versus yourself moment? So if standing up and talking in front of peers isn't something that you're super comfortable with, is that something that you can start to develop? Um, will that necessarily turn you into a professional footballer? No. Um, will it make you more comfortable speaking in front of people, which might have some benefits throughout the rest of your life in or outside of football? Probably. Um you know, what things will set you apart? Is it that you're just going to be a great communicator on the pitch? You know, there are players that um, I can't remember who was talking about. But, but, you know, you look at they were talking about um, somebody like Mila Yedinak playing for Australia. You know, unbelievable communicator, a general in the field. Did he did the job that was required? Unbelievable career, and you wouldn't say the most talented footballer that that we've produced. But look at that. You know, positions not being fixed. You know, all the time we say to players, "Hey, you're going to go and try this position." Hey, you know. We're going to try a different kind of formation. Can you go and play for a different team um, through whatever circumstance um, with a new group of players? Are you somebody that's going to say, yeah, of course I can. Yep, I'll give that a go. Because what if one day an opportunity comes up in a team where somebody says, oh, okay, Andrew, I know you're a right winger, but you're going to play left back. 
and if you play left back, here's an opportunity. Well, you you probably want to be ready, and you don't want it be, to be the first time ever. You know, are you resilient? Are you adaptable? And, and are you in there developing your super strength? And you know, the role of our TSP coaches is to help players do that. Round off the things that aren't quite so good, help with them, but really develop super strengths, best version of self. So, uh, we just got to say some sessions that everyone across TSP would have would have hopefully uh, done throughout throughout the program in, in warm ups or in sessions at, at the very least. Um, what can be learned from these practices? So, firstly, Warren, from an attacking point of view for players, what what can players learn from these type of practices? Yeah, I, I think with this one, it's a it's a very simple practice. Uh, the, the two bit two plus the two and it, it allows players to get lots of repetition in a, in a small area but be thinking about if you're an attacking player and that doesn't mean if you're a nine or seven or eleven or you can play across all of those positions it, it's what would you be doing in this position related to where it is on the field uh, and and the great thing about this practice and any of the practices that we've designed they're, they're fairly simple and not only do they give lots of repetition but they're easy to understand. So it's easy for players to actually now look at um, what does it mean to them as an individual and then how, as an attacking player, can they be proactive and actually taking forward touches, uh, understanding if they can't take a forward touch, how do they bring a team player in, into uh, play? And, and again, taking that scenario of, of ball, opposition, target space. And in these tight areas, it's going to require players to come up with quick football actions and because there's lots of repetition, they get plenty of opportunity to do it. And then, again, from that, that psychological uh, perspective, how are you putting yourself in a position as an individual that you want to win every single battle? Even in these warm-up exercises, even in these training exercises, you're giving yourself that self-belief that you're always going to back yourself to beat a player in a 1v1 situation. And, and beating a player doesn't necessarily just mean getting into the space behind by taking a player on. It might be that you've brought another player into play and then you're getting across and into the space and behind as well. So there's so many things that can come from it with, with that high repetition uh, relevance with the, lots of direction uh, all the time. But do the players, one, through its simplicity, understand what the practice is and then two, how do they actually lend itself to the position they're playing in in this particular situation as an attacking player? Great. So, Drew, any, uh, anything different or is there some similarities with defenders? I uh, look very similar, but obviously when you're when you're in these things defending, you can you can start to work uh, depending on which one it is. But you know, if if it's a one versus one and you're in there, you know, depending on what you want to work on, but it's not going to matter what position you are across a game. Whether you're a number nine or a centre back, there are going to be occasions where these kind of things pop up. So when the player takes their first touch backwards, is that a, a signal to you to press? So you might say to yourself, well, every time they go backwards, I'm going to make sure that I'm on my toes, ready to go. I'm going to make sure that I protect the ball into the to the um, in beyond me. I'm going to get used to the fact that if the ball does go beyond me, I'm going to instantly turn mm -hmm. and, and drop into the space to make sure that they don't get the ball back. If it's in say the two v two scenario, the three v three, we start to bring in the things like communication. So you know, generally, top defenders are also top communicators, and that again, that, I'm not just talking centre backs. I'm talking everybody. So if you're going to be in a team that collectively presses and that might be off triggers or it might be off plans that your coach has or it might just be off bad touches ball going backwards whatever it's going to be like we'll start to already bring those things in um you know and uh, communicate with each other become a good talker but also become a good listener um and it's just the simple habits there and look some of those sort of key coaching points are, are written there on the side but they're things that as players you don't need a coach to tell you that you need to be coaching yourself through something as simple as this, which is the kind of thing that goes on in it. You know, a lot of training sessions all over the place, but how much can you get out of it yourself to help with your journey? Can I just add to that as well, Drew? So sometimes it's also, um, we, we look at, again, the ball carrier, uh, and it's one, if it's a, a, we talked about the attackers, one that attacker has the ball at their feet, and then there's a defender, so there's always potentially a 1v1 wherever you are on, on the field and in this particular situation. When you're talking to the defending aspect, it's also thinking about, uh, are you the closest to the ball? So are you going to press? And because you're the closest to the ball, you, you might not be able to press because it's unrealistic that you're actually going to win that. So when's the right time to also then understand when to delay? 
And then as a supporting defender, if you're the, the one that has, if you're not the one that has press and understand and they've now delayed, how do you provide cover? So it's what, again, what's your roles and responsibilities both on and off the ball? And do you understand what they are? And if you don't, then don't, certainly in the, the talent support program, don't be afraid to ask those questions and not ask, just ask the questions of the coaches, but also your peers and the players that are around you as well. Uh, like, like I say, because that's the environment that we're trying to create. And there's lots of opportunity in here to get lots of pressure on the ball, but also when to delay, when to provide cover. And do you actually, one, understand it? And then two, how you can apply yourself and give you the best opportunity to get successful outcomes, even from this really small practice. Great. Uh, so during this wave practice, what uh, what can be learnt in the wave practice and what habits can players develop in here? Because I think it probably, probably goes on again, a um, bit like we were saying, depending on whether you're in that blue team, so attacking the goal or the yellows defending it, but um, there's going to be a communication element. Um, there's going to be, you know, a high, particularly if you're a defender here, um, can you communicate, can you read, and ultimately can you stay between the ball and the goal? Um, and look, practices like this, I think um, there's a tendency sometimes to just go through the motions. So one player's on the ball, I'm going to make a run, didn't get it, what does that look like? But if you start to really you know, delve into, well, what's the game and the match that I'm next going to play or a match in the future going to require of me? If you're going to make a forward run, you need to make that forward run. You need to time it. You probably need to bend it to beat an offside trap. So can you start to do that in things like this? One of the three is going to shoot. So probably at least one needs to be following in. So can you start to actually take some cues off somebody about to shoot and think, right, I'm on my way in here. It might be that the other one is going to also follow in or it might be that they're thinking what's going to happen on the second phase here. For defenders, can I stay up? Um, am I the one that's going to press the ball, like Warren said, or are, are we going to have to hold off for a second? Um, start to know your distances, right? When they get close, when do I actually have to commit to trying to tackle somebody here? Do I have to tackle at all? Um, if you start to get beaten, sometimes on one foot or the other or by a particular player, start to work out why is that happening? What's happening there? What can I do different? When I do win the ball, can I take some real pride in hitting whatever the target is at the other end? Am I meant to play it into a goal, into somebody's feet? The wave practices all look different, but don't sack that bit of it off. We, you know, when we, if we remember back weeks ago, we did one where we looked at Thomas Deng defending one at a couple of times and both passes back out, actually turned the ball back over. And we talked about, well, that's maybe the next step there. And you know, it's a couple of snapshots off it, but if you're a defender that can win it, retain it, release it, your team keeps the ball much better than somebody that wins it and gives it back or has to put it out a sideline. So look, a lot of these little things that we, that we talk about and, and ultimately what, what it is then as well is it starts to be that adaptable and, and resilient thing. So it might be that within a wave practice like this, you're a center back, but you're, you're on the blue team at the moment. Well, don't look at that as, an, ah, yeah, I never wind up here. So I won't do it. A, what if you do wind up there? You know, you'd love to know that, well, if I do wind up on the edge of the box and maybe it's going to happen only every now and then, but maybe you pick it up one time off a corner in transition or something like that, or whatever it's going to look like, it's still going to be an opportunity to take on a player. Can I finish? Can I get comfortable scoring? You know, and for goalkeepers, um, what does it look like in terms of communication? Can you get your angles right? Can you ultimately, if you're the goalkeeper there and the players are never getting the shots away, you're probably doing something right because you're communicating to the players in front of you. They're doing your first line and you're that last line of defence. And again, when you do catch it or save it, what is your next, what's your next action look like? And are you taking some pride with that? Great. Uh, Warren, in, the, in this way of practice, um, what does a you versus yourself practice look like in a practice where there's an abode? Yeah, again, you, even in this particular practice, you've obviously got a team objective um, to, to score, uh, to create and convert and to deny if you're, if you're a defender. So if you're, if you're an individual in, in this particular practice and you're, you're the, in the attacking team, uh, are you judging yourself individually on not only on the successful outcomes that you've contributed to that first wave, uh, but as Drew's point earlier on, it's about converting goal scoring opportunities the team objective is obviously to, to score the goal but how you've done it have you done it in a controlled manner you want to do it quick you want to be proactive 
but you want to do it in a way whereby you're trying to unlock the defence, understanding where pressure is coming from. If pressure is coming, there's potentially going to be space in behind. And if there's space in behind, how do you actually exploit that space? And if you do get into the space behind, how do you put yourself in a position that you do create and convert goal-scoring opportunities? And judging yourself on that uh, from a successful outcomes point of view is giving yourself the, the, the best opportunity to do that, but understanding all those different elements. Uh, when you're talking to the sort of psychological and the social aspects, even in these types of practices, it will break down and mistakes will be made. Uh, from a, a, a point of view of you're not wanting to, to smash your peers or, or, or tell them that they're not doing a good job, they'll already know that they're not doing, doing a good job potentially, or it might just be that they've made a couple of mistakes. How do you support them? How do you actually provide information in a manner which by it's easy for them to understand and retain? And as coaches, that well, that's what we're trying to do as well. And as players, how do you actually get that message across? So if they don't understand when to actually take the shot recycle the ball, move the ball on, how are you actually going to paint that picture for them by using both verbal and visual cues and commands? And we know that not all players are uh, very loud, but they can be very, very high impact players by having successful outcomes and by leading because they're trying to develop themselves at 110% every single time. So they're applying themselves to this particular practice and getting themselves in the right frame of mind, ready to go. So when that first whistle goes, they're switched on and they've maximised those opportunities in these tight spaces and these tight areas. That when it comes to the full game scenario, now they've got a little bit more space, a little bit more time, and they should even get even more uh, successful outcomes. Uh, and likewise, that, that's from a defending perspective as well. And, and, and again, a, a lot of these people, all of these practices that we've shown tonight are familiar to the players. They've done them before. They are quite similar uh, similar and simple to, to do. And that's what we want. We want that realism. We want that relevance. We want repetition as often as possible. And then if you take those those three things, that realism, that repetition, uh, and you put that into to practice and you're giving yourself that mindset that you're going to be the best version of yourself, even in these small practices, that's going to go a long way to you having a good game, whether that's a TSP game, whether that's an NPL game, or if you're fortunate enough to make it into a national team's camp, even in these training exercises, they won't be too dissimilar. But do you understand what it is that is being communicated to yourself to give yourself that best opportunity to succeed? Great. So lots of good feedback and review from, from tonight. Um, we, we always try and link it back to the players' individual development plans. Um, Warren, any final thoughts around the, the players now expanding on their IDPs from, from all the masterclasses and, and after tonight? Yeah, it, again, there's light at the end of the tunnel, which is fantastic. There's been a lot of time during the last three to four months and furthermore, with the disruptions that we've actually had to competitions and training environments. Now, with that light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully through that reflection process, you're giving yourself the best opportunity to really have a deep dive into to this particular slide and what it means to you. Hopefully, you've had a chance to speak to uh, either friends uh, individually, what does it mean to yourself, and then potentially parents or guardians that are supporting you as well. And as that, that critical friend, that one that you can go to that can give you honest feedback, but it's not telling you you're not good enough. It's trying to support you and give you a framework to be the best version of yourself that we talked to before. Being honest with yourself and, and just keep developing these. These potentially just become your journal for you on your journey and give you an opportunity to actually maximize. If you are auditioning, uh, to the Shannon Cole comment, you're, you're auditioning every single training session you're auditioning every single game that you play in, regardless of the environment. And you're using this as you go to all the time to develop yourself as an individual and understand what your role as an individual is within the team context, depending on the environment that you're actually in. Excellent. Um, do you have anything you want to add to around player IDPs? Look, just that it's, uh, these things should be evolving. So we sent these out um, a few weeks ago, um, asked everyone to, write something down and then sort of didn't didn't get back on the pitch and potentially everybody's been training maybe every day since then so it might have changed already you might have started to tick some some boxes off what i'd encourage you to do is um not sort of scribble it out or not just tick it off but print out another one go again do it now um in six weeks review again maybe th maybe you've 
you're looking at it going, okay, the technical one, I now think I, I've achieved that. The other three are going to stay on there. I'm going to rewrite this thing out again, keeping those three boxes the same, but I'm going to have a new technical one. And like, like Warren said, it then becomes a little bit of a journal where you can look back. So if you do this every six to eight weeks or so, um, it's going to constantly evolve and it's going to potentially be a, whether you're going to write it down or whether you're going to do it yourself, it can become something because there's no finite end to it. It's not right. Okay. Now I'm, now I'm technically, I'm done. Brilliant. I'm physically, I'm done. No matter what level you play at, there's always going to be the ability to continue to get better and you're going to need to. And then, so it's a great process to go through to continue to go, right. Well, where am I? Where am I really? What's the things I'm going to focus on? How am I going to do those? And, you know, tune back in with your TSP coach. Hey, what do you, what do you think now? I actually think that I've actually achieved that. So if we look at this one, you know, um, you know, I think I can pin my defender and protect when I'm playing. Would you agree? Yeah, look, you're doing that really well. Okay, what's next? Uh, now I want to get better at uh, two movements to be able to come short like I'm going to pin and protect. I'm actually going to run beyond. Brilliant. Way we go. How are you going to practice that? It just becomes this thing. It's, it's, it's an infinite game, right? There's not a, you don't win you don't win the journey of football. You're going to be going through it for, for as long as you go, no matter what level that's at. Um, and hopefully um, throughout your whole life, just continuing to try to, to try to get better at it. And as we said before, there's a very small percentage of people that are going to become professional footballers, represent their country, but hopefully um, good people that learn lots of good skills. And one of them is, you know, the thirst for continual improvement is a really, uh, strong characteristic in, in any young person or old person for that matter. Hopefully, yeah. So uh, thanks, Drew, Warren. There's some great insights for, from tonight.